everyone. My name is Sean McIntosh. I'd like to like to thank everyone for joining us today as we're going to discuss why all SAM tools are so bad at software asset management. The lines will be muted during the webcast and questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. If you have any questions, please submit them by the chat console and we'll do our best to answer them by the end of the presentation. If we're not able to get to your question, we will reach out to you and get you the answers you need. The webinar will be recorded and available for encore viewing at method180.com. We'll also send you an email following this meeting with the recording of the uh, webinar, the slides, and any special offers. So today, I'm joined by Danny Bedard. Danny is one of our senior analysts here at Method 180. Oops, sorry, I meant to advance, and I didn't. And Danny has over 25 years of licensing experience, including spending some time with Microsoft as an auditor. And the nature of our conversation today is this kind of came out of a blog post that I wrote, kind of expressing some of the frustrations that we have as kind of, let's say, folks who analyze licensing data with the outputs from the various tools and the gaps we're seeing in the marketplace. I want to stress we are not tool experts necessarily with the tool that you are using. We're going to speak a little bit in generalities today, but if there's very specific items that you want to go down a path specific to the tool that you're using, we can have those and take those offline. So, Danny, uh, maybe if you could say hello and introduce yourself. Absolutely. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking time to join us this afternoon. And as Sean was mentioning, we want to have a conversation around software asset management tools. We want to talk about a bit people and processes, and also some of the best practices that could be sort of applied against creating a baseline and dealing with all the licensing changes and complexities that software vendors are constantly adding to our workloads. So ju yeah. just to okay. move on, John, yeah, go. go no, ahead. I was just gonna say, as I kind of mentioned, this kind of came out of a blog post that I wrote with Danny's help. And it really, you know, Danny's kind of where the rubber hits the road for a lot of our customers in terms of they engage us. And Danny's the one who, in many cases, we'll be looking at the data outputs from their various tools. Right. So he has a has an insight into kind of some of the the shortcomings of the tools and some things that we're hoping to leave you with some information, things you can do to make your data easier to work with for everybody and better to interpret so you get better outcomes as well. Exactly. And we have a couple of examples that we've seen through our you know careers, engagements with customers where best practices were applied where best practices were not applied and the, the delta between both, right? In a SAM engagement or an audit scenario. So maybe from here, you know, what insights uh, do you want from your SAM tools? So there's a lot of weight uh, that is carried towards SAM tools being sort of the silver bullet in terms of what it can accomplish and uh, the accuracy as well. So as software asset management professionals, we all depend on tools uh, to reconcile license entitlements against deployments and also verify compliance. The problem typically is that uh, usage can often be misinterpreted uh, based on inventory data. So the inventory data is one thing, but the license owned is another silo. And sometimes uh, in the middle piece, the gray area is contractual terms and conditions associated uh, with your volume licensing agreement. So for example, you know, just calculating uh, an ELP, an effective license position, can be a bit more complex than just doing a one-to-one -one, uh, scenario. Uh, take a look at shared devices or a mix of on-prem versus remote users. So these need to be clearly defined in order to assign the, the proper licenses and move on with accuracy in your uh, ELP position. And I think the just to add one thing, Danny, I, I know we're gonna speak very much uh, Microsoft centrically today. However, a lot of the points that we're gonna leave you with today, we, we, we know can transfer across to most of the major software vendors. Exactly. Another key example is licensing virtual environments these days. So um, what we've seen with customers is that not our, all of the workloads are um, accurately represented in some of the reporting. So it makes uh, the license assignment a little more complex in terms of digging deeper and getting detailed reports of what's actually uh, uh, running on these virtual instances and back and forth. So for for someone who is not accustomed with complex environments, that can represent a lot of overhead just in, in terms of going back and forth with the IT group, 
uh, the consultant uh, doing the work and um, overall the, the, the management of this project. And finally, one of the key bullets, Sean, that we discuss is understanding your environments, production and non-production deployments and usage. So it's not only because a you know your naming convention includes words like dev and test and and staging that these are actually used for that purpose. And we've seen many times where there's conflicting information coming from the naming convention provided, server names, and also the um, overall uh, assessment in terms of uh, uh, in, an, in an audit, everything is deemed sort of production beforehand, and then you work your way back. So we wanted to bring, you know, uh, bring these points uh, across today because we'll be discussing some of the specifics around these complexities, but also uh, best practices around those to uh, alleviate potential risks. Yeah, because I think really, because as I've got up on the slide here, kind of our goal is to really help you understand, you know, what the shortfalls are that we're seeing in the marketplace. What are some actionable things you can do to get better data out of your existing tools and processes? And then at the end, we want to talk a little about how you can take it to the next level. Uh, because, you know, all these tools, they all say, well, I shouldn't say all of them, but most of them say they are a silver bullet and can do all of this. The reality is they all have different strengths and weaknesses, and some are better yeah. at some things than others. Okay, Danny, are you ready? Yeah, so okay. if you want to move to slide five, that'd be perfect because I already spoke to slide four. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, so yeah, so 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 this is the Microsoft SOM, the the um, the SAM optimization model. So we all know, and based on Gartner as well as you can see on, on screen, the more mature your SAM processes are with the tools in combination with people and processes. Uh, the more likely you'll be able to optimize your footprint and reduce costs based on the, the optimization work. So software asset management tools are designed to automate many of the tasks uh, required to maintain visibility and compliance with vendors. But we also have to keep in mind the control, right? The control of who can do what, which is very, very key in terms of introducing, uh, let's call them rogue deployments, non-authorized software that could jeopardize uh, the, orga uh, the organization's compliance analysis. So these tools, they do facilitate the analysis of the software position and they automate the data collection. This is all fine, but it also uh, is clear that some tools do have the capability to highlight opportunities to minimize the risk the compliance risk and to optimize cost. So let's think about the metering concept. So if you can actually measure usage, you can redeploy or reassess, reassign licenses across your organization based on that. And that's a key um, element in SAM, in the SAM practice where it makes sense based on a, you know, it could be a quarterly or it could be an ongoing uh, process to measure these things. So you can have better alignment with uh, procurement and also uh, your corporate roadmap in terms of usage. And if it's uh, you know feasible to maintain any maintenance on software or to disregard or just, you know, we can live with uh, a version that is uh, five years old for now, right? In terms of the functionality. So that's reharvesting licenses is a best practice in terms of cost. Uh, reductions and also uh, maximizing assets that have been fully paid for. So again, proper alignment of tools, people and processes and mature optimized SAM policies can transform the expected outcome because that's not gonna come out of the tool. It's the combination of a, a team, a tool, set it in corporate, you know, the, the, the corporate culture and also obviously uh, the tweaking of the tool. What, what are we expecting? Okay, we can switch to the, uh, the next slide, Sean. Yeah, so I think one of the things we talked about when we're kind of going through, did we jump ahead one? I think we did. Yeah, yeah, I think we... Uh, yeah. yeah, there we go. As we were kind of putting the, the blog post together, we talked a little about what are kind of the top reasons that kind of these tools break down or don't give us exactly what we want. And kind of one of the number one biggest issues is bad inventory data. And Danny can speak with some authority on this because he sees a lot of our customers' inventory data, and some of it's really good, and some of it is, <laughs> he can give you some good guidance in terms of, 
you know, what, what, what he's looking for, what an auditor would be looking for, and how you make it as clean as possible so there's no misunderstandings. So the word bad inventory data, Sean, as we previously chatted about, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the header. In reality, we're talking about, you know, incomplete, inaccurate, partial, um, flaky um, data collection, right? Where there's a task of stitching together and rationalizing data from different sources that could be somewhat uh, very, very uh, a complex task and takes time. There's no really, really silver or magic bullet around the um, normalizations of disparate sources. However, there are best practices to avoid these things. And, and, and in fact, you can not only rely on the tool. It's what you feed the tool. It's what you've configured the tool to report on. This is basically what you get. And on the other side, we've seen in market, you know, uh, customers, uh, you know, investing, you know, considerable sums of money a, a, on a tool, but they haven't implemented any SAM process or they were at the early stage of implementing SAM. So it's like putting the cart in front of the horse a little, right? So they made a bet on technology that would resolve internal cultural processes that weren't in place. So that's sort of, uh, you know, one thing, it's not the cost of the tool or the, the, the flashy uh, features that are important. It's actually how mature is the organization, at which level of maturity uh, are they standing and where are they planning to move on to in the, you know, three to five year uh, period. Because this is a process, it's not a one time event. And uh, everyone involved in the organization uh, has a responsibility, right? So in terms of you know, bad inventory data, as any data set, before you can process or analyze any deployment data, the information needs to include at least the basic key identifiers in order to accurately be recognized and processed by the tools. So as everyone knows uh, and familiar with SAM tools, the software publishers, number one, the software title, software versions, edition, and that moves on, right? You can go a little more gra granular depending on the tool and configuration in place. However, depending on the tool and version being used, there are known issues in regards to specific products. Uh, for example, Microsoft System, System Center requires additional configuration to accurately report, uh, for example, Exchange and SQL Server editions. So there's workarounds, there's tweaks, but out of the box, there's are some challenges. And I'm, I'm not picking on Microsoft, I, I'm just familiar with this, uh, this issue because everyone pretty much has a, a system center implementation somewhere in their organization. So in order to alleviate or to make sure that we have a couple of reference points while collecting data, you know, there's some best practices out there uh, using the, uh, the SWID tag. So the, the software identification tag, which is a, you know, an ISO standard. And that uh, uh, SWIG tag records unique information about any installed software application. So it records, you know, name, version, uh, vendor, whether it's part of a bundle or not. So the net of this is that the resulting outputs are totally dependent on the data collection input. And again, uh, as a best practice, it, it, you know, Using a combination of both the software ID tag and vendor SKUs, or stop keeping units, ensures proper identif identification and categorization of your software assets. And this is two sort of validation points that you can, that could be correlated within the tool and provides clarity. Danny, I just have a question for you. This is something I'm wondering. Get, you know, sure. Given your background as an auditor, when, when data set is, is substantiated, what sort of percentage of a scan are most auditors looking for, like in terms so, of a percentage coverage? Right, right. So, so on desktop, I, I mean, 90 to 92% is, is the, the baseline. Servers close, closer to 99 to 100% because servers are easier uh, to capture than desktops or mobile devices. But yeah, that's, that would be sort of the baseline without uh, having to extrapolate because extrapolation is not a science. So it will give us a ballpark um, estimation 
of what could be deployed, but in reality, there's no one-to-one -one validation on this, right? Yeah, so I know we, we sometimes, when we work with certain customers, I know some, one of the struggles they sometimes have is getting a, an appropriate amount of coverage even before they start getting into Swift tags, things like that. Correct, so correct. We're able to actually form, get a good handle on what their environment looks like and frankly, something that would satisfy if they're in an active audit. Absolutely. But for internal self-assessment, self that's a great exercise because you can see and you can push your tool to say, okay, what's our coverage? And as a reference point, Sean, you can take an active directory output, measure your active devices against what has been inventoried, and then you have a, you know, a, a result that will point you in either direction. Our, you know, our, the tool if it's agent list, this is, it could be a credential issue, but if it's an agent based tool, well, some, you know, some of our devices are definitely <laughs> missing agents. So it's sort of a review of the potential audit right beforehand. And this is healthy because it provides a lot of data point that is valuable to the organization in terms of what's deployed, but also uh, pending risks. So in an audit scenario where these, uh, uh, Unlicensed devices, or uh, you know, uncategorized or on inventory devices, are in the are in the environment. That possess, you know, sometimes these are not uh, actually accounted for from a licensing perspective. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of yeah, I'm, I'm you know, in terms of validation points, there's there's tons of them, right? But I mean, from a basic, you know, you know. Before saying that this is bad inventory data, we have to look at, okay, what are we collecting and what are we pushing into the tool, right? Yeah. Well, it's like the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. And, we don't Again, want to, and you don't want to misrepresent, have the tool misrepresent what, misrepresent what your estate actually looks like. Correct, correct. So on the next slide, Sean, and I, I mean, that, that that's a biggie, right? Because we're... we're <laughs> this is not only for duplicate accounts, right? So this is a lot... I mean, it's a simple it's a simple slide header, but I mean, there's a lot uh, based on, on 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 data quality. So, software asset management relies on one thing: data, but good data normalization. And one of the biggest challenges that we see uh, our clients facing when it comes to asset management is actually the data quality. So, the data collected from different sources simply does not go far enough in terms of the analysis and classifying each piece of software deployed. So, most IT and asset management tools do use what we call a catalog or a global dictionary of software titles to classify detected software. So, a good example of, of duplication, Sean, in this, uh, in, in, yeah. in this slide are software components or supported files that may be mistakenly recognized as licensable instances. So the normal, uh, the number one normalization priority not, is to present licensable counts or titles. And this is where SAM tools and SAM tool vendors or organizations, they need to constantly maintain and keep software catalog up to date in order to act, you know, exclude and accurately uh, reduce the noise of uh, from data. Anytime a new piece of software is, is introduced into the environment or detected, it should be somewhat analyzed and added to the catalog if it's a new piece, right? Uh, another good example on this topic is the data classification process. So once we understand, we know that uh, Microsoft Word is a Microsoft application, well, how is it classified? So we also know that, you know, through software ID tags and SKUs, it's possible for tools to actually do what we call the automated grouping of standalone application into bundles or suites. And assigning that, you know, category correctly actually triggers a lot of um, gray areas. So we're seeing in, in data sometimes, we're seeing the suite, but we're also seeing the individual components as standalone. So doing that cross-validation uh, uh, it eliminates the noise, right? Or the duplication or the potential, you know, duplicate license assignment through automation. The classification engine is also responsible for making, you know, for marking software such as, you know, the patches, updates, uh, fixes, drivers, and getting them out of the way. And, and, and mostly they reside on the OS, right? Most of these uh, um, components uh, are, are OS based. 
but they can sometimes, depending on how they've been tagged or packaged, be misrepresented as another OS running. So this is a major pain point with many in inventory tools and uh, we need to um, double check from a human perspective just to, to add that validation layer that the noise is reduced to a minimum for us asset management professionals to perform our tasks. So an efficient software normalization or classification engine ensures that only the licensable instances are captured and are in alignment with the vendor's product licensing rules for cross editions and version step downs through their applications and systems. Does that make sense? That does, that makes sense to me. So that's a key piece of the tools, right? That sometimes is, you know, out of the box, it's a uh, it, it's a good experience just to throw in some so, some noise in in your environment and to challenge the the tools, right? To see are they going to accurately recognize components from a suite and non licensable instances? I mean, this is something um, that should be a, an ongoing test, right? From a SAM tool perspective, to measure the accuracy. So on the next slide, we are talking about development and test environment. And this one's a little tricky because non-production environments, everyone uh, pretty much is aware of this. Uh, it could be anywhere, any place, any device. It could be you know, a desktop, it could be a server, it could be VMs, it could be um, a cluster of, uh, of, of VMs. So again, Microsoft, and I, I'm just gonna put the Microsoft definitions here, the, the, the brief one, but a non-production environment consists of computers that are exclusively used for purposes other than production, such as in development and test environments. These devices do not use or update live production data. So the key word in there, the key word is live production data because that's, typically against the rule to process and update any corporate or production uh, database data fed to a non-production environment. There's a stage within development and testing where you can actually upload some of this data, but actually you need to dis, you know, discard the data or you know, delete the data. You cannot bring it back into the production environment. So, a key thing to understand here is how organizations define and manage their production and non-production environments, and how do they assure compliance with that? And this is not uh, limited to development and test. It, it, you know, it includes IT uh, professionals. Uh, it includes um, uh, support technicians. Anyone that we would be in authority to spin up a server in a non-production environment or to access a non-production environment instance needs to be properly licensed. So some of the key questions for organizations is who is working or who, how many users do we have in our non-production environment? And the second one tied to that, now that we know how many we have, is how do they interact with these products? in testing, in UAT, staging, at which level, right? And how do we internally define our uh, non-production versus production environment? Is our naming convention, uh, do we have separate environments? I mean, there's always, always a way to uh, see a non-production instance mixed with production clusters or VMs. So we see this every day. And again, it's 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 a uh, it's sort of a, an exercise of you know trying to have two separate environments, and that's the best practice, right? Where it's recommended that you use a dedicated environment for your non-production instances. You know, you can have that domain set up specifically for uh, non-production. And at this point in time, if there is an audit or a SAM, well, it's easy easy to calculate the required licenses from a development perspective and not to have to weed out or to uh, argue or to uh, demonstrate that your users are actually non-developers. Because we've seen many times, Sean, that you know, receptionists, VPs of finance were actually um, assigned uh, you know, a Visual Studio license in some cases 
Yep. And the reason being is that their credentials or logon were on a server, but it was actually a one-time uh, event and was also for UAT testing. So Which actually, a lot Danny, of, may I yes. ask you a question there? So, I mean, I think it's a good point, but one of the things I would wonder is well, how, how good are a lot of these tools at identifying, you know, things like what, MSDN, Visual Studio, vis-a-vis -vis full-blown licenses? Because those have different rights and they're licensed very differently. Correct, correct. And and it's not at the entitlement level, Sean, I, that, that I would say that this is why it, it is a best practice to use a separate environment because that way it's a clear uh, it's a clear uh, disconnect from the production one, right? So anyone in the non-production domain actually needs to have a uh, MSDN or a developer tool Visual Studio license, right, to yeah. to access these uh, these assets. On the other hand, it's quite a bit um, confusing in a mixed environment where you have to weed out, well, this one is test, this one is dev, but I'm, you know, part of my daily routine is as a user, I use some production and I access, you know, because of my task, development instances, or I, I spin up server because I'm part of the IT group. So, and, and to your question, Sean, there's a way in terms of the uh, the software, the, the actual media used to deploy these instances because these are full-blown versions of every product that Microsoft produces. So, but there is a, uh, in, in the, the software ID tag, there is a way to recognize that this is uh, media from developer tools. Yeah, and I think the other thing is just, Danny, is if not everyone has the luxury of having a dedicated environment, but if you're using virtual servers, things like that, just having the name test or something like that in the name of the server goes a long way to helping someone like you, doesn't it? Well, again, and I alluded to this example, uh, you know, earlier uh, on, during, uh, you know, earlier uh, when we started, as opposed to the naming convention provides, you know, sort of a, hey, yeah, we can identify those as non-production. So let's drill down, uh, you know, if the uh, user logs or the access logs show that, you know, this is a wide use, corporate wide use um, device. Well, this no longer fit, fits the bill, right? So it, it's a starting point, Sean. But again, yeah. if you have a clearly defined domain where all of the non-production instances and dev tools and staging occurs, you're kind of protected against confusion, against the uh, assumption that, well, this may be accessed by more than uh, your, your, uh, your um, developers, right? So as a best practice, again, we, we recommend doing this. And we also recommend assigning dev licenses on a per project basis. So you can always reset these licenses every 90 days and reassign them to a new team of developers. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do to keep a log of all development project and their stages and all that. But I mean, from a licensing perspective, technically speaking, uh, a full-time architect, uh, you don't need to reset their licenses, but anyone that will collaborate into the project that will require, let's say, a lesser addition of certain you know, development tools. Well, at this point in time, it would be great to keep a log of who's doing what on which project. And based on the project's timeline, well, you can re-harvest this license and reassign it to another project and another developer. So these are sort of the key points, uh, you know, in terms of SAM and, 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 and uh, production versus development environment where it becomes really confusing and it's a fine line between, you know, uh, both uh, 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 status in terms of uh, usage. Okay. okay, makes sense to me. I'm gonna proceed, Danny. Yep, thank you. Okay, no problem. So I think one of the big ones is, you know, although our deployments are sometimes more static, uh, the licensing models can change very, very quickly, sometimes with very little warning. And it can, you know, even the way we count sometimes changes, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. So you know, software vendors, you know, and um, I'm not picking on anyone in particular, but, you know, are constantly seeking for additional revenue streams, right? Either through, you know, audits, SAM engagements. And there's also one lucrative option for them uh, when it comes to additional revenue is to change the licensing metrics for high volume products. So I'm pretty sure that everyone on the call today remembers SQL Server 2012. So the processors to core conversion was a quite a very difficult and costly transition for most Microsoft customers. And the reason why 
you know, moving from a standardization model to a computing-based model, um, no one saw that coming the way it did. So many customers were hit with a substantial cost increase, you know, sp specifically for physical SQL instance running Enterprise Edition. I remember doing SAM engagements where, you know, I I've hardly seen any standard edition of SQL because you know what, from a cost perspective, SQL Enterprise was sort of the de facto. Uh, they were deployed on, you know, quad boxes with uh, a high density core volume and no impact. However, when the change occurred and um, during SAM reviews and true ups, et cetera, the bill hit the you know the desk right and that was substantial in the same frame of mind a recent example as everyone is probably aware of is the windows server 2016 which also transitioned from a processor to core licensing model so again servers with uh, you know two cpus or 16 cores have little to no impact uh, of this change uh, however, you know, the cost has increased for any servers with 16 cores or more per CPUs versus the previous model that had no restrictions on computing power. So today for high density core servers, the increase can be up to 70% from the previous model, depending on the core factor. However, customers have told us that they remember the SQL server lesson and they, most of them had prepared in terms of documenting their assets, their physical cores, uh, to you know conversion, so they don't get the minimum. Uh, those that had uh, active EAs or software assurance made sure to document and provide Microsoft with the required information. So these core uh, the, the the core conversion mapped to their actual deployments, the core counts, the physical cores. So some customers missed the boat, unfortunately, and and Microsoft uh, and other vendors, you know, in the same boat, don't publicize this enough, in my opinion, because some customers were caught off, you know, really uh, buying net new LNSA to cover the gap between the core counts that were as a grant and the new core count required to, to remain compliant. Now, I think one other thing just to note there, Danny, is if, if you are one of those folks who managed to negotiate a higher than standard conversion, make sure you track that because Microsoft certainly does not keep track of that for you. And if you're relying on inventory tools and just basic licensing models that might be built into the tool, it will not take that into account. Correct, correct. And again, you know, our recommendation is to always document your deployments. Uh, and, and what I, I mean by that, is that you know your physical attributes? Uh, what's 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 deployed right now? Would it be servers and application? It's good to have like a yearly snapshot of what's out there, because additional licensing changes may be a reality. And also, Sean, a key thing is the product dependencies and a set of new premium features uh, that are now offered from your software vendor. So we all know that in moving on uh, with Office. Uh, 2018 and the, uh, the the releases in 2020 there's going to be a tight dependencies on certain versions of windows and uh it's the vendor's call right to set these uh restrictions or the, you know to set how the the software will install and interact i'm also seeing uh you know from from you know reading from blogs and all that that some features that we are accustomed to you know Let's call let's call it for you know office let's say well on office online some of these features will be become premium features so they're they're basically dissecting some of the capabilities based on analysis of usage and saying well you know these are now becoming premium features so again if you document what you have and are prepared for additional licensing changes um, you'll be in a better position to negotiate with your software vendor in terms of the impact or potential impact to your organization. Okay, we can move on to five. Okay. okay, and I think this is probably one of the ones that causes the most confusion for folks, which is 
you know, a lot of these tools um, have their roots in an environment that's more of a traditional computing environment where everything is on-prem and virtualization and cloud models have added a whole new layer of complexity to this to the challenge of kind of running these tools and getting accurate data, haven't they? Absolutely. And again, you know, accurate deployment data from virtual environments is sometimes difficult to capture. Uh, I mean, not, not to get, a, you know, a portion of it, but as a whole, in terms of accuracy, uh, to establish license, uh, the, uh, the according license requirement. So the first thing is the host of guest mappings, right? So we, we're seeing, you know, like every day I'm seeing in inventory data, what we call orphans or, you know, virtual machines that are not actually mapped to a host. So that VM exists and it does have a host. It's just that it's not being reported. So that's one one potential, um, you know, sort of mishap from, from the reporting tools. The other one is the physical attributes at the host level. So the, the physical processors and cores that are not act accurately reported. So from a licensing optimization perspective, it makes sense on some environments and some deployments to license at the host level to you know, have maximum virtualization rights and reduce cost. So without the proper attributes, it's really difficult uh, to assign now that we're core based on Windows, uh, the, the, the correct amount of data center licenses to enable that uh, unlimited virtualization. And another one is the actual virtual CPU allocated to SQL Server. So we all know that there is a four core minimum per VM. However, most of those are showing up as one, as two, and sometimes they're overstated. So the accuracy of what actually is um, attributed to SQL Server in terms of virtual CPUs is key from a licensing metrics to to be compliant, but not all, but not only uh, overpay for your SQL instances. So all of these have significant impact on potential license optimization process. So having a complete picture of the virtual footprint not only uh, um, adds additional an additional layer of clarity, but also provides significant cost reduction opportunities if you can maximize unlimited vir virtualization and also consolidation within your data center. Yeah, actually, Danny, this is kind of related, but kind of not. I mean, one thing I would also add to this, just it's slightly off of virtualization cloud models, sure. is just Active Directory and making sure that only appropriate people have access to software and servers that they should have access to. And the reason right. I bring this up is just, you know, I, I work with some softwares outside of Microsoft and, mm -hmm. you know, some of the smaller vendors have done things like come back to organizations and said, you know, a large subset of the environment is accessing said product on this server. And in one case, it was a company called OpenText who was going yes. after an organization that we worked with. And their licensing structure was that they licensed both on per user and device. So they mm -hmm. would actually multiply user times device. And you know, we were working with this customer on a self-assessment. And thank goodness we were, it was a self-assessment because it was well over seven figures in terms of the compliance gap, just because right. the server could theoretically have been accessed. Now, do a lot of the tools pick up those sorts of things or is that something that's really commonly picked up in? So this is more uh, this is more an Active Directory management or policy management uh, play, Sean. But you're totally right because if you have the right group policy objects that are targeting specific devices and users, you can restrict access to certain uh, applications that are published in, in, into that OU, and you can also mitigate potential risk as you um, as you explained in terms of we are making an assumption that, and they were actually double counting as well, users and devices, right? So yeah. in this in this area, and, and it's pretty much the same with remote access, you know, server-based application as well, right? If you have a defined group where you only publish to that specific device list or group of users, you're in a better position than the other side of the coin where, well, it's not usage, it's potential access. And that comes down to the negotiation piece where you need to be documented, you need to demonstrate that you have control of your environment in an audit, 
to mitigate those assumptions, right? Because again, they're not going to look for user logs or as access logs. They're going to use, well, potential access. There's no gate anyone can go, right? Therefore, everyone will be deemed requiring a license, and that could be very costly. Well, that makes sense to me. Thank you. Great. So the next one, Sean, I think we're, yeah, we're looking at OEM and retail products. Yeah, well, I mean, OEM and retail, these have always been kind of the sneaky ones, the ones that are almost like a vapor to track in many respects, particularly I'll go from a non-Microsoft perspective, you know, using one of our favorite ones, which is uh, Adobe, where you get, right. you know, they get come bundled with scanners, things like that. They just walk into the environment. There's really no proof of entitlement that exists anywhere other than the fact that you've got an invoice that says you purchased a certain scanner in, in the fine print somewhere on the retail box it says that it came bundled with a full version of something. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, uh, the gotcha with these uh, OEM and retail purchases is that, you know, unlike volume licensing software, most of these OEM and FPP full package products uh, entitlements, they offer limited use rights. So in the enterprise, they may also even trigger potential compliance issues. Think about an EA and qualified devices that need to run Office Pro Plus, and you end up with home and student and other versions of retail bundled Office suites. So these, they need to be taken off, right? A good example as well, uh, Sean, uh, is looking at how, you know, and this is, again, putting my Microsoft SAM hat on, but how Microsoft defines re-imaging rights. So the, uh, the re-imaging right, if applicable, are granted to customers in commercial licensing agreements. So re-imaging is permitted only if the product licensed under a commercial licensing program and media are identical to the licensed product that the customer wishes to re-image. So that being said, you cannot take, and I have a good example of this where, you know, a retail package and create an image on that and push it through your organization. It doesn't work that way. And you'll be out of compliance, even if you own the licenses. So we've seen customers with specifically that example, re-imaging a retail copy of Office across their, uh, their, their, their um, organization. So they had enough volume licenses to support all that, but they used unsupported media and in an audit, they were forced to re-image all instances with appropriate media. So another potential gotcha in regards to uh, retail products is that these products cannot be deployed on a server or be remotely accessed. So think about terminal server sessions, RDS, Citrix deployment for Office apps. If you're using full package retail media, you cannot do this again because this goes, it's in violation with the product use rights and in an audit, they would, uh, they would um, penalize uh, the, um, the users with licenses. So again, the software data collection, normalization, the categorization and optimization process can be complex and uh, will necessitate, uh, you will need a combination of tools, people and process to maximize the results. But at the end of the day, the better the normalization, categorization, the better the, um, the awareness of what's out there in your environment and the risk of running such media or versions of these software packages. Yeah, I think, Danny, there's another one that just came to mind for me, which is, you know, we encounter this at a number of our customers where they have, for lack of a better word, Windows embedded products where they've purchased a solution from an industry-specific yes. vendor, whether it's healthcare, whether it's an organization that makes, you know, radar subsystems if they're an airport mm -hmm. or something like that. And unbeknownst to the organization, there's a SQL server sitting inside that pre -pat. They just bought a solution, but there's right. a SQL server sitting there. It was licensed, but that license is technically, you know, not referenceable anywhere unless they go back to that ISV. If hopefully they're still in business <laughs> and find that. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's a fact, Sean. So, so yeah, absolutely, but. If we're talking about ISV licensing and what we call embedded licensing, so they have rights to pre-install on, on devices uh, some Microsoft products that are required for their solution. And, and in terms of the Windows embedded, that's a pre-license. So it's like an OEM machine if you buy it from HP or Dell. 
they will provide you with the Windows OEM pre-installed, which is yours. And as a corporation, you're going to buy a, uh, an upgrade license to deploy Enterprise Edition on it or to add software assurance on top so you can have enterprise features. So the base license comes with the solution. So in this case, the PC or the, uh, the ISV solution. But from an audit perspective, you're totally on. These SQL instances will show up and need to be conciliated back to the solution. And this is where keeping track of your documentation in terms of purchasing bundled solutions that includes uh, Microsoft technologies or any other technologies that is bundled with the solution is key to defend your point or to provide the evidence that you already paid for that license. So you, you don't need to double pay for those counts in, a, uh, in an audit scenario. So that's a great example in terms of, you know, the embedded piece, right? Because it's a gray area and tools will recognize the embedded edition of Windows, but they, it may have more difficulty actually uh, in identifying the SQL that is sitting on top of that and where it needs to be licensed from. So there's no magic, again, there's no magic between the solution that will broadcast, hey, I'm bundled, I'm fine, don't, you know, move on. But, uh, this is one of the things that, you know, keeping, you know, uh, precise documentations of these solutions uh, may come handy in an audit scenario. Okay, thank you, Danny. I think, you know, we've probably painted a bit of a picture today about a lot of the challenges these tools face. And this may, you know, probably it's not news to a lot of you on the call today. So I'm sure most of you have invested in certain tools. Yep. And, you know, you've encountered a lot of these issues. So. What I'm going to do now is we've given you a few things you can do to kind of tweak your data and move it around. But one thing we've put a lot of thought into is how can we make this better? And in our in the research and work that we've been doing over the past few years, there's no necessarily a silver bullet. There is no fully automatic thing where it's just going to wave a wand and make it better. But what we have done is we've realized that what's what's really required is a combination of people, tools, and processes. Yep. And so what we have done is Method 1AV is coming to market with a tool called SAM Compass. What SAM Compass does is we recognize the investment that you've already made in various tools. And this is just a managed service add-on where we work with you to get that data to the point where you need it. It's a subscription service. Uh, and really, again, we're not throwing out the existing tool or investment that you've made. We are just looking to layer on top of that and add the, the people's that tool, and when I say tool, it's the optimization piece that we've kind of injected our IP into it and process to get a clear and accurate understanding. Danny, did you want to add a few things to this? Yes, and, and Sean, you had it right there. So, so it's not displacing existing investment, it's actually complementing existing investments, but bringing more accuracy and um, visibility into day-to-day -day managed license position. So imagine this, if you had the ability real time to have a dashboard that would flag any compliance issues within within any vendors in your organization. So, so, so this is the goal we're working towards, to have this automation and logic in place so it minimizes time to dig for the situation and either pushes the information back to you. As an ongoing service, SAM Compass provides that visibility without disrupting existing asset management tools. Yeah. Essentially what it does is it adds in those gaps we have seen, we've kind of been talking about for most of the, the webinar today and effectively makes it as seamless and as close to automated as possible. Mm -hmm. That way you're getting that clean data right out of the gate, leveraging your existing investment. So another piece that, you know, like any asset management, we uh, professional, the goal is to have clarity, right? But point in time is a point in time. Live or ongoing is something that is, there's truly demand for the services on top of what's already deployed. So what we're saying is that the ability to generate an ELP in a matter of minutes, as opposed to a matter of weeks, changes the whole ball game in terms of, you know, there's you, you receive an audit letter, you receive a SAM engagement, you're ready. You have what is required 
to respond right away, even without going through the process. You have a response and you have the data to show for. And this is where, you know, with our backgrounds here and our, our track records with customers, this is where, you know, people, processes and tools come all together in an orchestrated fashion to deliver value and to optimize your investments. And I guess that, Sean, you know, in, in, in closing on my end, this is the big one, right? Because organizations, they must be able to effectively inventory their assets, but also they need to manage and secure all devices. Now with mobile computing and cloud, on-prem is you know, shrinking or morphing into other form factors. This is really important from a SAM perspective to have it rolled up into one well, yeah, I mean, it's becoming, uh, it's not even just so much, it's becoming, just becoming more complex as we move not from cloud to, to uh, on-prem, but really to hybrid and mixing and matching between the two. Um, right. But I mean, the really, uh, the idea for this is really, they often say the hardest part of, of anything is the last mile. And so we're, we're, we're quite confident that most of you have taken your, your SAM projects, you know, most of the way, except for that last mile. And what we're trying to do is offer SAM Compass to you as a way to get that last mile completed and get that truly meaningful data that you're really looking for out of the tool. So to that end, if you're interested in learning a bit more about this, it's really easy. You go to method180.com, which is our website. If you scroll down, there's some information about SAM Compass that goes into more detail about it. You can also click a form there and you can get on a personal call with, with one of our folks. When I say personal, we'll get a, uh, an, an, someone like Danny, who's an analyst who deeply understands asset management, to talk a bit about your environment and get, talk specifically about what you require. Or you can just give us a call. We'll be happy to put you in touch with the right people to learn a little bit more about this. Uh, and I guess at that point, Danny, I'm just going to say thank you, but I know we've got some questions lining up already. I'm going to encourage everyone who's on the line. If you have questions that we haven't dealt with, please submit them via the chat console. And I'm going to start in on the questions. Also, anyone who would like to, if you're feeling shy, feel free to reach out to Danny or I directly, and we'll get you the yep. answer that you need. Um, so I've got a few questions that have come in as you were speaking, Danny. So one of them is, you know, we run a tool, but Microsoft's insisting that we run MAP as well. Is this uh, safe and a good enough way to, to collect our inventory data? Okay. Yeah, uh, the Microsoft Planning and Assessment Toolkit, the MAP Toolkit, is primarily an agentless marketing tool that also assesses deployed Microsoft product and also suggests potential upgrades. So it is safe and is commonly used throughout thousands of Microsoft funded SAM engagements and software audits. And uh, it doesn't uh, require any, any agents and it doesn't report back to Microsoft. Okay, but I guess the question though is, you know, no matter what tool you're running in an audit, I'm just going to add to this one. I think I see where they're going. Microsoft seems to always request MAP data. Right. Is that is that true? Like that's it true. is. It is. It is. And and sometimes it's supplementing certain products that the preferred SAM tool did not pick up. We're probably thinking about additions of SQL Server or targeting a specific IP range just to make sure that we capture, we have a, a high level of percentage captured versus deployed. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, got another question. I encourage folks, if you've got some, to, to enter them now. Um, so what tool can, can I use to accurately report on VMware environments? So native vCenter reports or exports uh, provide excellent data. Uh, however, Sean, uh, there is a, also a tool called RV Tools that does an excellent job and is available online and for free. If interested, just Google RV Tools and you will see uh, that it's, it's quite a fascinating and easy tool to deploy and it uh, provides excellent reporting on your vCenters. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, I've got a, a, a couple more questions for you, Danny. So if you, if you don't have any tools or process, what's the best way to, to get an inventory baseline? Just get up and running. 
So again, no tools, no process. Uh, okay, so you're basically at the beginning. Yeah, you, you haven't implemented SAM at all. So I'd say any inventory tool, I mean, to, to, to capture what's out there in your environment, I would recommend the Map Toolkit. Why? Because of simplicity, it's easy to install, manage, and actually scan. And there's a quite a bit of uh, community users out there and and training documentations that to get you up and running. I've seen you know IT managers with you know short you know small staff actually uh, perform an inventory for you know thousands of devices. You know within a week they had good results, and it was a great experience for them just to get ahead and get on with the asset management piece, right? So the map toolkit would be yeah would be probably my my best choice to start with. No. Okay, excellent. And I have got one more question right now, which is, and I think this question is regarding SAM Compass, which is, okay. how do you normalize our our tools, so SAM Compass's data, with the often custom tools that auditors like KPMG or Deloitte and Touche like to use? So it's based on the normalization engine, right, and the software catalog. So any tool that has been picked up by uh, any any scanning software, any SAM uh, tool, will be run against our normalization catalog. So we typically go for the raw data, and it, you know, to measure our success rate, we also run in parallel with existing tools, just to compare the differences between both normalization engines. Yeah, and I also add, you know, just I get the impression if 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 this tool if this question is being asked, I think the next question is, you know, this kind of steps into you know audit defense that you know you've got a one one version of the truth, exactly. you know, coming from Sam Compass vis-a-vis -vis what the you know the uh, KPMG or Deloitte and Touche tool is saying. I think the key thing we do that there are going to be differences, and yes. what it is then is is we believe we're quite confident in our tools ability to have them dead to rights on this. And that's when it becomes a negotiation. It becomes a pulling out those exceptions on the spreadsheet and uh, kind of negotiating from there. As we often say in our in our audit defense and audit, when you're in that final stage, it's a negotiation. So it's a matter of having defensible evidence that you can kind of go, no, your tool is wrong. Ours is right and here's why. And having all of that tied together. And that's really what Sam Compass provides. And it, we're quite confident that it would be quite defendable in an audit situation to uh, the tools that KPMG, Deloitte & Touche, or any of the other uh, players, yep. smaller software asset management vendors that do audits on behalf of other folks use. Absolutely. So, okay, well, I think that wraps up uh, all of the questions that we have for today. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to everybody. We really appreciate you taking time from your busy day to, to join us and talk a little bit about software asset management. We, in the next day or two, you'll be getting a copy, a link to the recorded webinar. We'll be getting the slide deck. We'll also be sending you uh, just some links in there as well, one to the blog post that this presentation was based on, and also one to uh, a link if you want to book a uh, brief demonstration of Sam Compass at, kind of at your own time. It's kind of pre-recorded, and you can watch it at your leisure. We'll give you that link as well, or by all means, as on the screen there, just reach out at method180.com if you want to do things directly and we, someone will get in touch with you very quickly to, to address anything. And lastly, if there's any questions that folks you know, weren't, weren't comfortable asking in a public forum today, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to take those offline and deal with them uh, independently. So with that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Danny, thank you so much for sharing all of your uh, in insights with us. It's really helpful. Thanks for the opportunity, Sean, and thank you everyone for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Take care, everyone.